Welcome, everyone. I'm Angelo Robles, host of the Angelo Robles podcast, and I'm the founder at Family Office Association. Really excited about today. I know you all say that I say that all the time. That's because I only have guests on that I legitimately am really excited about. Venture capital, VC, and the disruption of the investment management industry. And it goes much deeper than that, as you'll learn. Our special guest today is David Tetton, founder of Versatile Venture Capital. David, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to be here again. Well, thank you, David. And that is such a, and I mean this in a good way, but a grandiose title. The investment management industry is a significant industry. And it's no surprise that technology and fintech and all around it is disrupting the industry. But why don't I have you give our audience a level of context in terms of how big that market is and kind of what has changed and what's happening in the last couple of years? Sure. So disruption has become an overused term that the whole conference called disrupt. Um, but I'm interested in technical disruption, meaning Clay Christensen, professor at Harvard Business School, who wrote the famous book Innovator's Dilemma, had a technical meaning of the idea of disruption. And so I recently published a, a large research project, uh, which you can see on the FOA website, on what is disrupting the investment management industry. And I mean that from the point of view of the classic Innovator's Dilemma and Clay Christensen's foundational research. So my co-authors and I, uh, Katina Stefanova, formerly on the management committee at Bridgewater and now CIO of our own multi-strat hedge fund, uh, what we did is we said, what are the jobs to be done of an investment manager? Clay Christensen famously found that when you look at disruptive companies, they often start with a one simple job to be done and work up from there. So in technology, an example would be uh, uh, would be personal computers would start off as basically toys that you use for games and recipes and worked up the ladder to more sophisticated applications and greatly disrupted a lot of traditional technology industries like uh, mini computers, supercomputers, and so on. Um, and so we said, what are the jobs to be done of the investment management industry? And we surveyed and met with family offices, sovereign wealth funds, institutional investors, others who are large, large allocators. And if you had asked me as a novice VC a decade ago, what is the job to be done of an investment manager, I would have said, well, grow your money. But that's actually the wrong answer. Uh, there are several dozen jobs to be done of an investment manager. And what we did is we figured out what are all those jobs to be done. And our view is that the next generation of disruptive investment management technology companies will be ones that focus on some of those different jobs to be done. Very interesting. And maybe you said it's more than just simply growing your money. If you could dive a little deeper into what some of those other functions are. Sure. So to me, the paradigmatic example is Vanguard and index funds. When Vanguard launched a few decades ago, people laughed. They said, you're selling mediocrity at a low price. Who is going to be dumb enough to put money into mediocrity at a low price? And they faced a lot of resistance. A lot of people didn't certainly did not give them any money. And then that company grew and indexing grew. And of course, indexing has become an enormous part of the investment management industry because they do a really good job of selling mediocrity. I mean, that in the technical sense, right? They're selling median performance uh, at a very low price. So the job to be done there is to not fail to meet the benchmark, to keep your expenses low, because it doesn't matter how much money you make, right? There are always enough expenses theoretically to offset the amount of money that you make. Um, and they do that really well, and they have gained share from a lot of traditional active managers. So another example is early stage VC or technology uh, VC, which has grown dramatically in the past decade. And that's because in my world, VC, we as an asset class do a terrible job on liquidity, right? Terrible job on transparency by the nature of the asset class, but the returns have been quite good, right? So people are willing to take the benefit of good returns as a job to be done. And that offsets the fact that we as an industry are not going to be as good on other things like liquidity and transparency as say publicly traded hedge funds. Uh, you bring up something, it's going to sound off topic, but I think it does circle back into investment management. I mean, active management has not necessarily done so great over a 10 year period. It's done a notch better uh, during COVID. Let's broadly go with that. But my big picture point, especially for more of the mass affluent, 
Uh, many of them may be better off in passive, very liquid, low cost strategies. So that brings up the question of to the value of someone, let's broadly go with the term financial advisor. Is it really more goal setting, psychology, staying on course, and really less to do with the actual a pure investment part of it? So there is research showing that financial, people who have financial advisors get better returns than those who don't. But ironically, I would argue, and I don't have a dog in this fight, right? I'm not a financial advisor. Um, but I would argue it's because a financial advisor, a good one, will keep you aligned towards your goal and help to stop you from doing stupid things like, oh, gee, right. uh, you know, such and such market is red hot. Let me put all my money into Russia in you know, January of this year, and then maybe that didn't work out so well, right? So, so that, there's a lot of value to that because the average person will make emotional, poorly informed decisions, and having a, a third party out there who looks looking out for your well-being, even if you're paying them a percentage of assets to do it, can be very helpful. Um, so, uh, I'm sorry, continue. I, I certainly agree with you that there, there's endless academic research showing that the average retail investor will do better in the liquid part of their portfolio by putting money into index funds. Um, and you probably should not be trading individual stocks unless you are a professional stock picker. You work for a hedge fund, mutual fund, something like that, in which case, sure, you have an advantage. Um, but my relatives, I tell them, don't compete with the professionals, right, because they're better at it than you are. Just put your money into mutual fund, hedge funds that are in the liquid public part of your portfolio. And this brings up the discussion, which probably plays into what you're focused on to some degree, and that's the advancements in fintech, AI, uh, the advent 10 plus years ago, and how has it improved of the robo-advisor. And just like I'm seeing in biotech and biotech AI, about really is the future going to be in the power of artificial intelligence? And basically, after making that comment, what's been the advancements over the last decade or longer in robo-advisors? So first off, anything that gets you to systematically look at your personal wealth in one place, preferably, meaning at least one dashboard, um, and pay attention to it, that has value. Because a lot of people have money basically piled up and they've got $5 million in cash and they're just not paying attention to it. And especially in the last year, right now that inflation has gone up in many countries globally, including, of course, the U.S., right? There's a real cost to you in having your money in plain cash. Um, so I think it is absolutely good financial hygiene for you to create a personal dashboard, either via service like Betterman or just have a spreadsheet, which is not going to be as good, but take what you, you have, uh, and pay attention to how all of your assets are allocated. And to use the example I just gave, right, if you have money in cash, that was okay you know, some time ago before inflation. It, now it is costing you about 6% a year to have your money in pure cash, right? And you probably should think about something that at a bare minimum mitigates inflation. I would agree with you on the surface, just to play a little bit of devil's advocate, because I, I guess I like to do that, David. I had on a pretty prominent guest who's an economist last week, and he said, hey, like I got a pretty lot of money in cash right now. And I said exactly what you said. With the impact of inflation like never before, you're basically losing six, seven percent, maybe more. And very calmly, he stated, yeah, as if it's been so great in whatever, stocks, bonds, real estate, crypto this year. Now, I thought that was meant to get a little bit of a charge from the audience, very short-term thinking. However, here's where it could make sense, is the opportunity to have dry powder, to have cash available to pounce on opportunities as they become opportunistic. Now, I'm talking more like an active manager now after beating the drum on passive a little while ago, but this is why this does become a complex discussion. So first off, I want to put in a plug for a company I have no investment in other than I am a U.S. citizen, uh, Treasury Direct, where you can get uh, where you can get inflation protected instruments that pay you the rate of inflation. Right. So I think everyone should at a, almost everyone should at least consider putting some money in there. Uh, there is a cap on how much money you can put per year, but the cap applies per person. So you could put money for all of your family members. Right. Um, so that's something I've done, and I think other people will benefit. Second, to the point that you're, the person you interviewed made, so what he's really talking about is the job to be done of optionality. 
So a less sophisticated investor will have liquid cash because he will think, gee, if IBM suddenly has a scandal and the stock drops to 50%, I'll buy IBM, right? Like nice, safe stock. They're not going out of business tomorrow. Um, and he wants that optionality. The more sophisticated investor, like some of the hedge fund managers I know who manage their own personal money, they actually keep zero cash on hand. They have money in stocks. And if they ever need liquidity to go, I don't know, buy a house that suddenly became available that they really want, they just borrow against their assets, right? If you have enough assets, that is a more sophisticated way to keep the optionality, the real job to be done, without the cost of carrying cash. So uh, fundamentally, I definitely disagree with your prior speaker. Uh, there is a very, I 100% guarantee you, if you have your cash, your money in cash, and inflation is 7%, you are losing money every year, right? If you have it in some instrument that has reasonable inflation protection, right, you at least are not going to lose that amount, right? And that's worth real money. And I did get a little off topic to the robo-advisors. I don't want to let that one go because I think this is, when I learned about it, probably had to be a good, what, 12, 13 years ago now. So it's been around a while, but I don't know, did it kind of stall in the community? Uh, is the community looking to protect itself and the financial advisor's livelihood? But I also go back to what I said earlier regarding goal setting, the psychology of investing, and maybe that really is the core role for many advisors that you're not going to get that human element, but those advisors could still be using AI and let's go with the word robo-advisors and tax harvesting and mitigating taxes, even if it's a human-facing person that's interacting, correct? So for the robo-advisor industry as a whole, the challenge that a lot of the firms ran into is that they acquired their, their low CAC, low customer acquisition cost folks early, right? Young, tech-savvy, mass affluent type. Um, and then a lot of them had challenges getting beyond it. And the reason is the average wealthy person is like, think about your 60 year old retired dentist, right? It takes more work to get them to trust you, to give, give their assets to you. And so what did a lot of these firms do? They started to hire people who look like FAs, right? Or invest more money in conferences and other human touch points because they realized that they had to figure out other ways to get people to give you assets. Um, so that's a generic challenge. And of course, they're facing competition from the established firms, right? Like Morgan Stanley acquired E-Trade, right? Because they wanted to get customers who preferred a tech interface to their system. And they knew that that was the future, right? The generation of people who always want to just call and make a trade, those people are gradually fading off. Uh, and the next generation, they mostly want to engage through chat, through screen, et cetera. So to your point about AI, so first of all, in the world of VC, AI is sort of like cinnamon. People sprinkle it everywhere in the hopes that it improves the flavor. Um, people may tend to misuse the term in places where it may not actually fit. So uh, I will submit that for certainly some of my experiences, some of the legacy financial firms I've engaged with, some of the well-known publicly traded services has been pretty bad. And they don't need AI. They just need to fix their back office so I can e-sign instead of printing stuff out and signing and faxing it, which I literally have done for some of the global financial firms in my own personal dealings. Um, so there's a lot of room to improve the financial services industry services to investors before you even get to cool, sexy stuff like AI. Uh, with regard to how AI is being used in the space, so uh, there are lots and lots of people doing it in the world of liquid public markets, right? So uh, well-known hedge funds like Two Sigma and D. Shaw, they're using all sorts of really, really interesting data sets and technologies. I'm an investor in companies like Earnest Research um, and Cardify, which sell data sets to these type of clients. So th both those companies sell data sets of credit card data, debit card data, other sorts of transactional data, which gives you real-time insight into consumer behavior, behavior. That's very actionable, very exciting. Um, and to me, an area of particular interest is the private capital markets. So in the public markets, we've seen this multi-decade trend towards the use of greater data analytics and the emergence and success of firms like Adi Shaw and Two Sigma, which internally look more like software companies than like Warren Buffett using a pencil and going through a 10K, with due respect to Warren Buffett, who's done just fine with that manual approach. Uh, so in my world, in private markets, most private equity and VC firms, their technology stack 
is Excel and Salesforce.com, and maybe they have a, some, some, a few other basic tools. There's a lot of room to do it better. And I know of some of the top 10 private equity funds who don't even have a proper CRM implemented that all of the staff are using, right? Instead, the individual partners are keeping their data on their phones because they're possessive of it. So I think there's a lot of room for us as an industry to do a better job of making investments through use of technology. I published a detailed roadmap of what that looks like. I just put in a link in the chat. And that's the vision of Versal VC. Part of our vision is we want to be best in class in our use of technology and how we run the firm. And we have been and will be an investor in companies that are serving the needs of the private capital markets to help people like me and you who are investing in private companies to be as effective and successful as possible. As I'm hearing you talk and talking about even the highest level PE firms and professional shops, and we're talking about the mass affluent with many things, I'm going to turn my direction a little bit to family offices, something that hopefully I know a thing or two about, founding Family Office Association. It's often no better, at least pound for pound, in many family offices that are not leveraging the proper aggregation and reporting uh, taxes, uh, CRM, there's massive inefficiencies in the vast majority of family offices that are not as efficient. And what's more important than efficient is being effective as they could be. Do you agree? 100% agree. Uh, that was part of the inspiration for Adapar, one of the investments we made at my old firm, FF Venture Capital. Adapar was co-founded because one of the, the team, Joe Lonsdale, started his own family office in his late 20s. Great time to do it if you have the assets. And he realized family offices often run an Excel and PDF. And he said, surely, there's got to be a better way to do this. And Adapar has done very, very well serving family offices, RAs, other players in the ecosystem, and allowing people to get better visibility into the true value and risks of their different holdings. Classic example, a lot of people will say, I'm an investor in 10 hedge funds, right? There for have diversification. But then if you look through what are the holdings of those 10 hedge funds, and nine of them are investor in the same hot stock that blows up, you weren't as diversified as you thought you were. It's a tremendous risk management tool. And maybe another time we'll have you back and we'll discuss a whole bunch of actual names and brands and what works best for the mass affluent, for family offices, for those that are more active in private deals. So that will be an exciting conversation. That is one of my favorite subjects. I'm going to switch over a little bit to broadly the world of VC, which is an industry that now I go from family offices to something that's closer to your backyard that you're very familiar with. It is one of my favorite quotes. I twist it, but I'd like to get your interpretation of it by prominent VC Mark Andreessen that software is eating the world. I would ask you, how is it eating VC? Yeah, so I certainly agree with my distinguished colleague, Mark Andreessen, uh, on that. So in the world of VC, a couple of dynamics that I'll highlight. First off, the bar for entry to being a VC has gotten much lower. There are many firms like AngelList, which make it much easier for any random individual with a network and some capital to go into the VC space. And the result is that they're empowering a whole wave of what historically were angels into becoming mini VCs. And some of those will graduate and become institutional VCs or they'll get partner jobs at established VCs. And I think that's really exciting for the industry because we're funding more innovation. A lot of people see America as a leader in innovation, but if you look at the number of startup companies, we actually rank relatively poorly. Um, there are reasons for that beyond the scope of today's conversation. So w any, anything that gets more capital into competent entrepreneurs is a good thing for America, right? It's more people have shots on goal, have the chance to build young companies, some percentage of which will become meaningful, impactful companies. Uh, from the point of view of established VCs like myself, uh, I mean, my, my firm, Versal VC, is a new firm, but I've been in the industry for a decade. Uh, the challenge is that those are the disruptors to me, right? Those are the people coming up, uh, the, the small players. I remember vividly being in a dinner for partners of New York VC funds a number of years ago, and someone in the room said, hey, guys, what do you all think of AngelList, which at the time was a very small company? And someone else says, I think they're sort of like the remnant inventory of our industry, right? It's all the deals no one touches. And someone else said, isn't that sort of like Hyatt saying that Airbnb is the remnant inventory of hotel rooms, right? So I agree with that critique, right? Um, 
Angelus is clearly working up the ladder from the small deals, the deals that other people may not consider quote unquote hot, into more established investment opportunities. And that will create a lot of value for them, which they already have done, and challenge established players. So how do I and other more institutionally minded VCs compete? Well, so one of the things that that you have when you're building an institution, which is what I'm doing, is you have enough scale to support your companies. Any one angel doesn't have scale, right? They can invest in a couple companies and make some intros, but they don't have the ability to support a lot of companies. Uh, I built the platform function, meaning the, the function that supports all of our portfolio companies at the two prior VC firms where I was a partner. And so figuring out ways to systematically increase the odds of success for my companies is one of the things I love about our asset class. In public markets, when you put on a trade, you go long IBM, what can you do then? You can pray, you could hedge, you could sell. That's about it, right? You're fundamentally passive once you put on the trade. So in my world, I can actually do things. I can introduce them to potential clients. I can work with them on the strategy. I can bring in some super value-added co-investors. And all of those things increase the odds of success for that firm and increase the, the odds that we're going to have better returns. Let's stay on the subject of EC because I know one family offices are very active and should be in the world of EC. I'm fascinated by it. I've interviewed many of the thought leaders. I love going out to the pockets, uh, Silicon Valley, Boston, Aspen. Well, not, <laughs> I do like Aspen, but I was thinking more of Boulder, Austin, et cetera. And like you said, uh, out of the US over the last 10 or 20 years, it's been an explosion. I mean, look at Israel but also look at the Far East, look at even Eastern Europe. Uh, so yeah, like maybe we are losing a little bit of that. The US is completely dominant in the world of you know, entrepreneurs and even VC. But I'm gonna, I was gonna ask you the angelist question, how that's disrupting more early stage. Uh, but I will also ask, there's other forces at work that may be making it harder in some areas for VC. Uh, from DAOs to tokens to effectively the world of digital assets coupled with AngelList and what else is going on. Now, I have another spin on that, but before I get to that, why don't I get your feedback on that? Well, I wouldn't view it as harder so much as it's my job as a VC to be on top of new technologies and figure out new startup opportunities that emerge from it. So, that's always going to be the job of a VC. And that's one of the things I love about our industry. I have friends who have made a lot of money investing in auto stocks or certain other sectors, right? And they're specialists in that. And that's what they do all day long is they look at the same industry, right? And they update their models. And that's worked well. But some of them say to me, look, I'm kind of bored because I've been looking at the same thing for a decade. And I'm always looking at new things, right? So Dow's, uh, crypto, all of that, they certainly create new opportunities um, and new challenges, but, but that's a plus, not a minus. Uh, there are other challenges, like a huge one I'll highlight is this gradual divorce between China and the U.S. That's certainly been really bad for a lot of people who are investors in Chinese tech companies, which have taken a huge hit right. as a result of recent Chinese government actions. And I think that the the TAM, the total addressable market for some Western tech companies, has probably shrunk in the past few years, because historically, if you were a Western tech company, you might have China as an addressable market. Depending on what exactly you're selling, that may not be realistic. You may just have to assume, look, we're just not going to be able to sell to China. They're going to have a domestic champion. I'll have to build a business in the rest of the world. I mean, the whole concept of VC and professionals like you who've been in it for decades and, you know, even Andreessen, who's a monster in the industry, and obviously they're very active in Web3, uh, is it still 100 companies, 80 will probably effectively go to nothing, 10 will break even or make some money, five or six will do okay, maybe five or 10x, but you really do need that one or two to have tremendous returns to drive the portfolio. But if the professionals knew which ones were going to be the ones, they wouldn't necessarily need to invest in whatever, 30, 50, 100 or more companies. Uh, I think the historical idea of this being a home runs industry, uh, that remains true for many VCs. There is a way to get around that, and that's core to my approach to investing. I view myself as a value investor, not a momentum investor. And 
one of the great ironies of our industry is in hedge fund land, almost every hedge fund manager will brag about they invest in the undercovered names, right, that the analysts aren't covering. They dig them out out of the, the woods of Nigeria or whatever. And at the same time, right, a lot of VCs will brag about how they're very good at getting the hot rounds that everyone else is pursuing. So you see the disconnect, right? So it's an, yes. a reasonably efficient market. So, so my view as someone who originally grew up in the public markets when I was an investment banker uh, is that I prefer to be in the game of identifying under, undiscovered gems as opposed to the game of chasing after the hottest sector. There are definitely people who have done really, really well by playing that game, the latter game of chasing the hottest sector and the hottest space, the hottest names. Um, but the challenge there is those companies are often dependent on their next round of financing to stay alive. Right? They require permission from the capital markets to stay alive because they're not profitable and they have no immediate path to profitability. So I have a general bias towards companies that have a path to profitability. And then I always have downside protection because if need be, the company can just turn off some market initiatives and turn to profitability uh, with maybe just a little bit of capital or zero capital, depending on the exact dynamics. And then they can grow out of the fact that their sector may have fallen out of favor. So I've been a VC and in tech long enough to see this dynamic, right, where companies spend a lot of money because they, they've raised a lot of money and they think that's the way you build a company, but uh, then they fall out of favor and whoosh, everything's changed. And they have no plan B. So I think that my fundamental job is to identify the companies that are not hot today. And then if all goes well, they will become a hot company and the big hedge funds are going to crowd in on them. And that's good for me, right? Because the valuation's gone up and companies growing. But I don't want to be dependent on the other ecosystem players for the company to achieve that level of success. Uh, David, am I wrong? But the perception that I have and maybe statistics I looked at a couple of years ago, a lot of the returns among VCs were very, very driven, maybe unlike hedge funds, by the largest shops from, you know, Andreessen at Andreessen Horowitz, you know, 16AZ, uh, to all the big 10 that we would know. Now, the challenge becomes even a family office with a significant, although who doesn't check anymore, but let's go with that vernacular, they're not going to be able to get in. They may need to be waiving $100 million or more, and even then I'm not sure sometimes. So they often have to go through a fund of funds. So that begs the question, since you're launching your own venture capital firm, what are the opportunities, the niches that you're focusing in, and are you getting in very, very early stage before the larger, more traditional VC shops get involved? Yes, we're, we're definitely investing early before the, the top 20, 30, you name it, funds are likely to get involved. Now, of course, a lot of those larger established firms, they will say we invest at seed, and it's true. Many of them do. Um, but by definition, right, it is a pyramid. There are vastly more small seed stage companies than there are Series B companies. Even the largest, most active later stage VC, can't, they can't possibly cover and get in conversation with all those small companies. And they also make mistakes, right? They will not invest in a company that turns out to be a winner. So I, I, there's this perception that our industry is competitive. In the seed stage, I don't feel that at all. The vast majority of deals I look at, the founder is challenged to find investors in their company. And my experience is there's no correlation between the heat of a deal at point of entry and subsequent returns. The small, small number of companies where everyone is crowding in, those are companies which, by definition, they're in hot space, so they usually have a lot of competitors. Valuations tend to be much higher. Investors typically have fewer preferences, right? A less desirable position on the cap table. Uh, and that means that all tends to subtract from your returns. You asked about sectors of interest. So we are particularly interested in fintech, uh, although we have flexibility to invest outside of that. And within fintech, I have two major areas of interest. So one is the tech stack of the private capital markets, which I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. And the other is the investment management industry, investment tech. Uh, the whole industry of putting money to work is an industry which is very lucrative for a lot of its participants, but has a lot of unhappy clients like the pension funds that are not going to get the returns that they need to hit their, their goals, their, the, the needs they have to fund their uh, underlying obligations. And so I see that as an opportunity to take analog dollars and turn them into digital dimes through young companies that can better serve the needs of the money holders.
And I'm going to go back to a question that I asked earlier. I guess I want to expand upon your answer. Okay, so AngelList came along and that changed the dynamic to people being more active. And I'm going to go with the verbiage, kind of bypassing earlier stage investing. Uh, I do believe that DAOs that I mentioned earlier, uh, now there's a variety of regulations that may come down. We'll see how that will play out in the coming months through the year. But again, this does appear to be something. Is this a threat? Let me say something about threats. And you hinted at it with AngelList. Those that are so close to the action, they may not see it. Maybe they don't want to see it for a variety of factors. And then boom, it comes along and it made a dent in what they were doing. Do you think that DAOs could really be very impactful to your industry? Um, so we're still very, very early on DAOs. Very, um, very. I've, <laughs> yes. I've seen a number of companies get funding that are tools for DAOs. Um, I've seen, I feel like I've seen more of those than I've actually seen companies that are using DAOs to manage something. Um, we already have an established framework for managing entities based on your shareholder vote. It's called the traditional shareholder system, right? That's how companies operate. And there's a very, very complex body of law for how that operates, how you protect minorities, et cetera, uh, minority shareholders. So I, I think that DAOs over time, they'll have to replicate a lot of that legal ecosystem um, in order for them to, to address the inevitable challenges they'll, they'll have. Like there's a reason the legal system evolved all of those rules. So my general filter on Web3 is I don't invest in technology per se, right? In other words, I don't go to the world and say, I want to invest in companies that use this cool new technology. I go to the world and I say, I want to invest in companies that solve real world problems through use of technology, if crypto is the best way to solve a given problem, great, I'll invest. But if not, then don't use crypto, use some different approach. So an example that one of the uh, successful investments at my prior, one of my prior VC funds is Terra, which is a cryptocurrency out of East Asia. Oh, and of course, South Korea. The, the, yeah, uh, the, the initial inspiration for that was in East Asia, there's no euro, meaning there's no currency that crosses borders. Every country has its own currency, which hinders cross-border commerce. And the checkout process and e-commerce website is much more burdensome than we have in America, where you literally on Amazon have one-click checkout. So the founding team said it would be really valuable to have a quote-unquote currency that you could use across borders when you're doing e-commerce and that had a better checkout process. Right? That's a real-world problem, and they had a solution which happened to be a coin. And on that insight, they built what has become a very successful, uh, oh, very influential 100%. ecosystem. Yeah, Do Kwan, I believe, from Terra Luna, one of the co-founders, yeah. was brilliant. That was a very good investment, <laughs> at least in my opinion, my humble opinion by your prior shop. I'm going to dig a little bit into, I was actually going to mention that verbiage, Web3. Uh, so we went through Web 1, what, 25 years ago, Web 2, Web 3. There are some that question whether it is going to reach the potential. Of course, my audience knows I'm going to go with yes, and I do have a variety of reasons for that. But this really puts, one, it must be scary to the gigantic companies that make up effectively Web 1 and Web 2 companies now. But if I was a VC firm, as opposed to fighting it, and progress. And I'm old enough to remember with the internet, they're absolutely, even in the, your industry back in 89, 90, 91, 92, that, oh no, this is not going to go anywhere. It's not going to be anything. Uh, yeah, they were obviously laughably wrong. Web3 putting the power in the creator and how it ties in with DAOs. Now, here's what I will say. Here's what I will say about some of the people that question aspects of it. It's supposed to be decentralized power in the hands of the people, but when the big VC shops get their hands on the tokens and they start to manipulate, I can make the argument whether really it's really decentralized. Uh, is this just the new flavor for still those in power and authority to have a level of control that appears to be less visible? Uh, I think that's a fair argument. I don't know if you want to get into that philosophical discussion on Web3, but Yes, to the other side, I do agree that there is some scratching in the head on true decentralization, given the VC firms have gotten very active in that community lately. 
Uh, I would submit that there are always strong forces pushing towards centralization, right? Like in America, we have a democracy. We also have PACs, right, on both sides of the aisle, which quite legitimately fight for the goals of their, their shareholders, right? Um, and they are centralizing power in themselves above and beyond the power of any one individual vote. So they do vote bundling, right, and uh, other sorts of means to push the political process towards their favorite goals. And that's to be expected, right? Same thing happens in the world of a DAO, where people will form alliances, they'll figure out a way to get a large shareholding, et cetera, et cetera, so that they can sway the community towards something that is in their self-interest. Oh, for sure. There's no question that that happens. And I'm, I'm going to go off on an Angelo tangent for 20 seconds, and I'm going to stop and we'll get right to it. But if you're, I mean, I've been doing this a long time. I know lots of family offices. Let's go with thousands. If as a family office or an ultra, ultra high net worth investor that's watching this, if you're not at least becoming familiar with DAOs, with Web3, with the impact of the creator economy and community, and what's happening broadly in crypto, uh, in the world of the metaverse and NFTs, then like, I don't know what to tell you. I'm okay with you saying I'm not going to invest now, but you got to make your own thesis. And uh, by the way, you're going to be wrong because <laughs> there's going to be elements of it that are going to be wickedly successful and very dominant. By wrong, I mean broadly those that may be complete naysayers without keeping an open mind. And remember, many of us are old enough to remember the early days of the internet. And trust me, there was a lot of people that were naysayers back then. Uh, David, it's an unfair question, but you're going to get it because I ask it to almost every VC. Is VC an embedded Ponzi scheme? Yeah, so you're quoting Shamas Palpatia, who said that. Yep. Uh, and I, what he's referring to is, going back to what I said earlier, that a lot of VC operates on the model of the company's not profitable, right? It is default dead. The only reason it's alive is because some VC gave the money. They will stay alive only so long as every year or so they raise more money, right? And so a lot of the industry is reliant on some new person putting in money. And a lot of VCs, they have this clear economic incentive to have someone else put in money at a higher valuation because then they get a paper markup and then they can fundraise off that for their fund two, fund three, et cetera. And there's significant research from Josh Lerner and Paul Gompers at Harvard Business School showing that unsurprisingly, there's a quid pro quo going on, right? So VCA submits his company to VCB saying, hey, guys, look at this company. VCB invests at a higher markup, which is good for VCA. And then you know what happens two months later? VCA invests in VCB's company at a markup, right? So people are yes. quite legally colluding to move up the paper price because it's good for everyone. Uh, the founder is getting diluted, but his company is staying alive, and he has a chance to continue building out that company. Um, so so that's the, the nature of the industry when you're dealing with companies which don't have a reasonable path to profitability. I'm very excited about companies that have a business model, that have a path towards profitability, because then you're playing a different game. One of the great ironies of our industry, of VC, is we're supposed to invest in the growth companies, right? That's our job. If you look at the Inc. 5000, which is a neutral list of the 5,000 fastest growing companies in America, you know how many have actually raised VC? 7%. So that means the, the market penetration of my industry of VC across all of my competitors is a whopping 7%. So why is that? Well, one of the reasons is because a lot of founders don't want to play this VC game of getting diluted to be minority holders after two or three rounds and being perhaps pressured to grow faster than the business can organically grow. And one of the ironies of our industry is VCs get a lot of money from family offices, but most family offices did not make their money by becoming minority shareholders in their own business, right? They made their money by keeping usually 100% control, maybe with some kids, and building their business over time. And then at some point, they had a liquidity event. So there are ways that traditional VCs can engage with founders who care about control, about not playing a traditional VC game. And I'm very interested in that. How do I grow that 7%? Like rather than fighting for the 7% with the other VCs, how do I penetrate further into the 93% of fast growth companies that haven't raised VC? I didn't know the numbers were that dismal relative to raising VC. I thought it would be like maybe half. That's a shocking, shocking statistic. Very intriguing though. Uh, 
what are, how can I phrase the question? What are the limitations of technology in VC? So one obvious one is that in the public markets, the established hedge funds that use these sort of tools, like I mentioned earlier, DSHAW, Two Sigma, they're using an enormous, a, a sort of absurd number of data sets, like satellite tracking imagery and how deeply a ship is in the water and so on and so on, to look for patterns. And in our industry, there's usually poor data. Most obviously, you might have the the aerial imagery of ships in the water, but you don't actually have the financials of the company unless you're, you're a shareholder or you're friendly with someone who's your older who's not complying with his fiduciary obligation, which some people don't do, um, to keep that confidential. So, um, so that is a, a hindrance, right, that you're missing some of the most foundational data. And I see a lot of people investing in companies now, private companies, without even asking for real financial data, let alone verifying that it's honest. Uh, so, so, I, um, uh, so you have to adjust for that. And the good news, though, is that our industry is much less uh, transparent and competitive than the public markets because of the factors I mentioned earlier. And so if you have any sort of edge, that edge is more sustainable than in the public markets where everyone's fighting over it. I, I know people at large hedge funds whose job is just acquiring new data sets every week that they can feed into the giant machine to try and figure out some new, new edge. So, for example... If you're able to tap into new communities of founders, uh, like, for example, in a couple of weeks, I'm chairing a conference uh, by Women's Sphere, which is a group that's like Davos for women. Um, and you may have noticed I'm not actually a woman. Um, but the reason for that is because I'm trying to position myself as a, a value-add investor for founders who, who may happen to be women. And there aren't that many people who look like me who are proactively marketing to women founders. And so that creates differentiated deal flow for me. That's not an example of technology per se, but it is an example of an inefficiency in the industry. Uh, research from first round capital uh, that they published a while ago showed they had better returns when they invested in companies founded by women. And I look at that data and I say, wait a second, you just quantified the cost of bias, right? Because you're saying if you had been totally gender neutral, you would have had better returns and you weren't, as you yourself acknowledged. So therefore, there's a cost to your particular filter bias. And if I am systematic about not having that filter bias, I will have better returns. Yeah, I mean, I believe Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank, has also recently made a comment relative to his analytics on his own companies that he invested in, which have done better. Uh, you've invested in companies that are kind of an intermediate between investor, uh, let's go with family offices and investment opportunities. Are you allowed to discuss one or two of them? Sure. So for example, uh, one of our most successful companies, my old firm is Republic. So Republic is, uh, they're actually, they have an affiliation with AngelList. Uh, the CEO used to work there. And it is originally, it's a, a, it was a marketplace for investing in private companies. They've expanded to other alternative asset classes like crypto and real estate and so on. And what they've done that required a lot of legal work, the founder is a lawyer by training, um, is they have made it possible for retail investors to put as little as 100 bucks into crypto, into real estate, other sorts of asset classes. And so they're expanding the investable universe of where you can put capital to work. And that's exciting for me because there's a lot of opportunity for investors to, to get better turns in areas they're passionate about. And at a small scale, uh, one of the, the reasons why people invest is because they care about something. So if you see a, a new bourbon company that you're excited about, you can actually, you may be able to buy shares in that company via Republic. And historically, that wasn't possible unless it was a very established company. Very interesting. Uh, is there an other, was it Indiegogo? There was another company, I believe, that also yeah. kind of served that purpose, if you could talk a little bit about them. Yeah, so Indiegogo, uh, which we invest in FF Venture Capital, my prior firm, and then ironically, they hired a new CEO who was formerly CEO of another portfolio company. So Indiegogo is a platform for crowdfunding, um, originally artistic projects like movies. That was the reason for the name Indiegogo, like indie films. And then they've expanded to particularly technology startups. 
And so one of our success stories on it was I'm an investor in a company called Interaxon that makes a brain-sensing headset uh, that's used for sleep, improving your sleep uh, and for ADHD and other sorts of brain disorders. So when they were just getting off the ground, they ran a crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo, and they said, we're a startup company, we're very high risk, we're out of Toronto, and we're building a super cool technology, but we haven't actually built it yet. Please give us some money, and when we build this cool technology, we will ship it to you. So no equity. They're just saying, this is a pre-order on something we haven't built yet, and it's risky and hard to build. They got $300,000 of capital from people who said, that sounds really neat. I would like to have a headset that can read my mind. And they not only got 300K cash that they used to develop the device, but that was super validating to us as a VC because you said if people are willing to give you cash for a product you literally cannot ship because you haven't built it, that shows that people want your product. So we should invest in your company, buy equity in your company, because there's going to be a bigger market when you actually start to ship this, this product. Very interesting. Yeah, there's just so many opportunities with entrepreneurs and bridging the gap to investors, uh, including family offices. It is an invigorating time in terms of what's going on in the community. Uh, I always love your, I believe it's at uh, teton.com, T-E-T-E-N, your blog. You've been doing it for years. If you could talk a little bit about it. Sure. So what I've done, I, I view my job as a manager and an investor um, particularly as I work with my portfolio companies, is I have to have a process. And especially when I mentor junior people, right? If I'm responsible for process, I have to write it down, document it, iterate it, make it better over time, and train people. And so what I've published over the years in my blog is a whole curriculum for how you work as a VC, how you build a VC firm. And this is the sanitized version of the materials that I've built for my own internal colleagues at my two prior VC funds. Um, so I have built out a lot more content than many folks, but the reason is by the nature of my job, I write a lot. And so I just sanitize and put the, the things that are appropriate to put in public on the, the site. Uh, and the purpose there is especially in a COVID world where it was for two years much harder to go out and meet people in person. I still, of course, want to meet new people because that's the nature of being a VC. And I made a point of positioning ourselves so we were, we were uh, very visible on the search engines for the search terms that people care about. Just as one example, as you probably would guess, the, among the most popular terms in search are free and money. So if you go to versatilevc.com, there's a button on that site that says free money. And that is the number one most click button on our website. And it literally is free money because what I've done there, and no one else that I could find has done this, is I've aggregated all of the different sources of support for early stage private companies that are free. There are accelerators that will help you for free. There are consultancies that will give you advice for free. Uh, there are various services offered by large tech companies like AWS, IBM, Microsoft, like free server uh, hours, uh, um, uh, resources for free. And the goal there is to be of service to founders and attract them to my website and my ecosystem. And then, of course, they'll come to me. At some percentage of them will come and say, hey, can you please invest in our company? And I'll invest in a percentage of them. Very interesting. Yes, I highly recommend David's blog. It's fantastic. He's a real veteran. He's been doing it for many years and always keeps ahead of the curb, not just resting on laurels. So I always enjoy David's work. David, really excited uh, that you launched your own VC. Uh, tell us a little bit about it uh, from your sector focus, which I think is pretty obvious after this conversation. Any other little nuances? And I believe I will remind the audience that this would be for accredited investors. Sure. So at a high level, we're an early stage uh, VC with particular interest in FinTech based in New York, where I live, uh, with a tilt towards East Coast companies. But there's a lot more to it. So there are a couple of assets that we've built out that we don't think anyone else in the industry has built, which are designed to make us a platform company, the third and final act of my VC career. So the first is we've created a whole set of resources for founders in transition. My thesis there is that when you're a founder, right, like myself, you're in a different part of the labor market. You're not working up the ladder of a couple of large companies the way most people do it. And you have different life options in front of you. If you, once you founded a company, 
whether you're successful or not, you can go found another company. You can be an angel. You could be a VC. Uh, you could consult. You could be a serial board member. And so we have a whole set of free resources on our website, and that's designed to, to be of service to founders, serial founders. And then we have a gated private community just for founders in transition. Again, it's free. And what we do there is we share resources unique for this community. So, for example, if there's a startup looking to hire a CEO, we post that in the ecosystem, and that goes out to the members of our community. Another asset we've built out is our tech stack, which is already much more robust than most early stage VCs at our level of development. And the long-term vision is that we are best in class in our use of technology and analytics. And that allows us to build a really scalable firm. One of the great ironies of our business is that it is very, very common in VC for partners to work at a firm for a few years and then spin off and launch their own firm, right? And that's exactly what I'm doing. But you don't see that in other industries, right? If I work at Amazon and I'm a senior executive there, I can't quit Amazon and start a direct competitor, right? It doesn't work that way because Amazon has so many resources, I can't walk out the door with those resources in my contact directory, right? So at best, I could start a niche competitor and then you know, maybe I can aspire to compete with Amazon over time um, like Jet did, uh, but that's, uh, that's not really... It's a very different dynamic, and the reason is there's equity value there, right? There is an institution there that goes beyond the, the possession, the portability of any one individual. So thirdly is we are, as I mentioned earlier, a value investor in a world of momentum investors, and that tends to attract a different set of, uh, of companies to us, and we think that that is a better investment strategy for returns for Vintage 2022 Fund. And David, for those that would like to learn more and reach out to you, could they go to the website? Do you have an IR person you want to give their contact info for? How could they learn more? Uh, just go to versatilevc.com and just go through the contact page there. Yes, that would definitely be recommended. Uh, a comment before I do a close, a reminder to everyone. I think VC is an incredible asset class. It supports entrepreneurs. There's potential for interesting returns. And this is a more complex asset class with a lot less research and diligence, obviously, than in public companies. What I'm getting to is you need to do your own diligence if you're qualified and potentially going to be an investor. Everyone's cash needs, liquidity, time horizon. And you may be watching this video and things changed a month, a year, or five years later. This may be evergreen. You may hear it 10 years from now. You need to make your own decisions. This is for entertainment purposes. And you must always understand when you invest, you can lose money. So simply, I know I repeat my little mantra pretty often, but it's the reality of how the world works. So you must understand that. It's been really great to have David on. I launched FOA in 2008, meaning Family Office Association. I think I met David maybe a year or two after that. I've always enjoyed his blog and the work that he's done and really being dedicated to the community. It's been a great pleasure to know him. And David, I wanted to one, thank you for being on the show and dedicating your time. Angelo, it's been great to see the continued success of FOA, and I'm honored to be part of the community. Well, you're very kind, David. And to the audience watching or listening in, I'm Angelo Robles. Many of you from around the world don't know me really from Family Office Association. You know me from the Angelo Robles podcast. But I guess you could say I have a day job, a founder and CEO at Family Office Association, which I love. Go to familyofficeassociation.com to learn more. And many of you could follow me on social media. I'm probably most active on YouTube, where very simply we're Family Office. A David but again, I thank you so much for your time. Thank you to our live audience today and those that will watch or listen in the future. We hope you enjoyed it. David, until next time.